banking is boring. For most people, it's just a place where they put their money for safekeeping and take out the occasional loan. But banks have been the cause of a significant amount of economic problems for the last century, aided by the central bank, often called the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve and banking in general have caused more harm than most realize, with no end in sight. Since they control the money, they can control the people. It sounds kind of cliche, but they really do indirectly control people's decisions. But not just individual people's decisions, but the decisions of entire countries. Banks probably aren't these anime villains who want to control the world just for the sake of power, but the end result is all the same. All of these corrupt banking practices are abetted by the Federal Reserve, an institution we are told stabilizes business cycles, controls inflation, maintains a solvent banking system, and regulates the financial system when in fact it only makes these things worse. It extends business cycles. It creates out-of-control inflation. It allows banks to create fake money out of thin air, and created what Thomas Paine called a nation of stock jobbers. Okay, real quick rundown of what the central bank does. It controls a country's monetary policies. It controls things like the amount of money in circulation. It controls the federal funds rate, which is the interest rate at which banks can lend money to each other. It regulates banks. It regulates financial markets and anything else involving money. The first ever central bank was established in 1668 in Sweden. And by the late 1800s, most developed countries had one. But the United States didn't get one until a bit later. The American Central Bank has been around since 1913, but the problem of centralized money goes way back to 1775, when the Continental Congress issued paper money that was inflated to the point of worthlessness that no amount of price controls could fix. If you don't know what inflation is, here's a quick rundown because it's very important. And it's not the stuff that Power Cynical's into. Oh, fu oh. Inflation is the rate of increase in prices over a given period of time based on more money entering in circulation. If you double the money supply, money becomes twice as abundant, so it's less scarce, which makes the currency half as valuable, which will make a goods cost twice as much even though the product itself hasn't changed. Since money itself isn't inherently valuable, making more money doesn't create wealth, whether it's gold or paper. Money is just the representation of the amount of productive work done. When the money supply doubles with no changes to productivity, the product will cost twice as much. The continental dollar disaster caused most people to want a more stable and harder money. So the constitution placed a ban on paper money, for states at least, to stop the country from being flooded with unbacked paper money. So Alexander Hamilton founded America's first central bank in 1791, but it only lasted 20 years. Then another central bank was founded in 1816, but was killed by Andrew Jackson in 1836. And after that, the US went without a central bank for close to a century, but people who would benefit from a central bank, like bankers and business people, started to get in power in the early 1900s. In 1908, Congress created the National Monetary Commission, which existed to pass banking reforms and was always pro-central bank. The commission was staffed by agents from the largest banks in the US the First National Bank of New York, Kuhn Loeb & Co., the Bankers Trust Company, and the Continental National Bank of Chicago. It also helped having a president who was pro-central bank, William Taft, in office. Also there to assist in getting public support of a central bank was the Wall Street Journal and other publications. They did their best to convince the public that a central bank is good for them, even suggesting the central bank can do other things, like bail out failing banks to smooth over economic downturns. Then, in 1910, a secret meeting took place at a Georgia coastal resort called the Jekyll Island Club, which was co-owned by J.P. Morgan himself. At the meeting were members of the most powerful families in the country. John D. Rockefeller's man in the Senate and brother-in-law, Nelson Aldrich, J.P. Morgan's senior partner, Henry Davidson, director of Wells Fargo, Paul Warburg, and the National City Bank vice president, Frank Vanderlip. With the help of an economist they hired, they drafted the bill that would soon become the Federal Reserve Act. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed by Woodrow Wilson, establishing a sort of cartel for the banking industry. 
bankers were permitted to inflate the money supply at will, which provided for themselves and the financial system as a whole liquidity in times of need, while also protecting the bankers from the consequences of bad loans and overextension of credit. The Comptroller of Currency said this to Congress after the Federal Reserve Act passed. Under the operation of this law, such financial and commercial crises, or panics, as this country experienced in 1873, in 1893, and again in 1907, with the attendant misfortunes and prostrations, seem to be mathematically impossible. Don't worry guys, now that the currency is completely controlled by the banks and government, it has become a mathematical impossibility to have an economic crisis. Well, it didn't take too long for this mathematical impossibility to occur. The Great Depression happened 16 years after the Fed's founding, and we've had plenty of recessions since. Some say that the Federal Reserve is a private corporation that exists to ensure banking profits, so they say it's a capitalist thing. Others say it's a socialist thing that exists to give the government enough money to expand itself as much as it wants. They are both right. The Federal Reserve benefits the banks and the government, at the cost of everyone else. It's the worst of both the private and public worlds, but to say it's a purely socialist or a purely capitalist entity is disingenuous. It's, it's at a weird spot in between. One of the tenets of the central bank was that it would control inflation when the market overheats. Well, since 1913, the US dollar has only gone down in value. A dollar in 1913 had the equivalent buying power of $31.30 today. This inflation has been beneficial to the rich. Wealth inequality is a multi-factored phenomenon, but one reason for this growing income gap is inflation. The wealthiest own stuff that has value. They own things like land or businesses, which are inherently valuable since they produce value or have the potential to do so, or at the very least retain their value. They don't lose value in the way that the dollar does. So inflation is generally a good thing for the wealthy since they own the most assets, which go up in price when inflation hits. The people who don't own appreciating assets get left with their depreciating savings accounts and stuck with wages that may or may not keep up with inflation. But even if everyone's wages did keep up with inflation, it's still very much a bad thing. It makes it impossible to save. If you want to retire early, you can't keep your savings in cash. Otherwise, your money will lose a significant amount of its buying power over the years. Inflation is essentially a tax on savings. If the central bank increases the amount of money in circulation by 10%, your savings lose 10% of its buying power, while the government gets to keep its buying power. Since no actual productive work gave these newly printed dollars value, the buying power of the central bank stays the same, and this poor sap just loses buying power. This may seem pointless, but this is extremely useful for paying off debt, since the dollar amount owed doesn't change. Most countries have dug themselves into too deep of a hole to get by without inflation. Nearly every developed country is in historic levels of debt. The US government alone paid $659 billion just for its loan interest in 2023. The Federal Reserve, having the ability to tax anyone anywhere for as much as they want, creates short-sighted, ridiculously expensive bills and programs for which inflation is used to pay for these short-sighted benefits promised by politicians to get short-sighted voters to vote for them. Only one or two generations gets the benefits of all this free money provided by the Fed. In the long run, it destroys the future generation's buying power. Banks are businesses and have to make money to stay afloat. Most businesses have to worry about going under if they make bad financial decisions, but banks aren't held up to the standards of other industries. The Federal Reserve ensures that banks are too big to fail. Banks used to survive by doing boring stuff like being frugal and conservative and not taking financial risks the size of countries, but that's boring. It's way more fun to 10x leverage all the money we have in the vault. Banks used to operate like any other business and had to take risk assessments. So they didn't do things like overextend credit or give too many loans out because it was too risky. But risk assessment is a small thing for the banking industry now since it knows it will be bailed out if they create a big enough problem. 
During the early 1900s, banks being too risk adverse was a popular argument for the Federal Reserve to be established, since banks didn't expand credit as much as people wanted them to. So inflation had popular support. It was a great way to help farmers pay off their debt, since money becomes less valuable and easier to get since there's more of it in circulation, so it becomes easier to pay off debts. Just ignore that future generations are gonna have to pay more for everything. The more pure gold standard, not the Bretton Woods gold standard that started in the 40s, was still a thing in the early 1900s, and people viewed this standard as a way to benefit big banks by keeping credit tight for their own interests. Many writers for the Fed and big banks still say this today, acting as if having super elastic credit is inherently good. Keeping credit tight is not necessarily a bad thing. Having artificially low interest rates and loaning out money to any Joe Schmo is how we get massive system-wide loan defaults. Having loose credit was the main cause of the Great Depression and the 2008 financial crisis. The Federal Reserve was created by bankers for bankers. The government-backed Federal Reserve has continuously allowed and even encouraged really dangerous banking practices by giving banks bad incentives. Things like bailouts give the green light to do really risky things, since they know their deposits are guaranteed through the FDIC or that they'll just get a stereotypical bailout. Or banks being allowed to have comedically low reserve ratios and the government encouraging banks to take bad loans. Banking is first and foremost about making a profit, just like any other business. They want to offer a good or service and hopefully make money in return. But what separates banking from other industries is that the government often bails them out if they make terrible financial decisions, which is paid for by the average citizen. The Federal Reserve gives banks a privilege that every industry would kill for. Privatized profits and socialized losses. The government doesn't only bail out banks, it bails out other industries as well, but it's especially prevalent in banking. You would think since banking is one of the most regulated industries in the US, they wouldn't get into this much financial trouble. But banks get into more trouble than most other industries. Of course, not all banks get bailed out in a crisis. Lehman Brothers, for example, was left to die during the 2008 financial crash, but most other American banks were bailed out with a nearly half a trillion dollar package. Hell, the United States government even bailed out European banks. It's not uncommon for companies to get bailed out by the Fed, but banks get extra coddled. Banks are one of the biggest recipients when governments take money from people through taxation or inflation and gives it to corporations. Banks wanting special privileges from the government has been going on since America's inception. Oftentimes when an economic crisis hits, the government tries to centralize money more and more in an attempt to stabilize the economy. This gives the government more and more control over money and making it easier for them to fund whatever they want. This is how government debt has gotten so out of control, which I'll get into more detail later. Since banks are super interconnected with the economy since they are the main player in the financial markets and manage things such as derivatives, insurance, equity, loaning, deposits, or money markets, so banks going under puts the whole economy at risk. But why do banks so often have financial troubles? Is it just business cycles? Is it just the nature of things? No, it, it's not. Most of the time, banking crises are caused by extremely risky practices done by banks. A 2006 study by economist Jesus Huerta de Soto blames fractional reserve banking for our economic instability. When someone deposits $1,000 in the bank, the bank may only hold on to $100 of the initial $1,000 deposit. The bank loans out that $900 to someone, and the person who took the $900 loan pays someone with that $900. The bank account still says it has $1,000 in that account, while the other guy still has $900. That means that a $1,000 deposit turns into $1,900, while the bank only has $100 in reserve. This cycle can be repeated again and again. The guy who was paid $900 puts money in the bank, and the bank does the same thing with his savings. They loan out 90% of his deposit to someone else, and the cycle keeps repeating. A $1,000 deposit can turn into $10,000 flowing through the economy. $9,000 just magically became real. A real-life infinite money glitch. 
banks used to be required to hold on to at least a fraction of their depositors' money in reserve, historically between 7 to 17.5%, but as of recently, they aren't even required to hold a fraction. They actually don't need any reserves. Now, instead of calling it fractional reserve banking, it would be more apt to call it no reserve banking. Most modern economies operate on fractional reserve banking. It's not just an American thing. Although most countries don't have a 0% reserve ratio, places like the European Union have a whopping 1% reserve requirement, and Japan has a 0.8% reserve requirement. The Fed allows this to occur to help money get into the economy and to encourage lending. But fractional reserve banking makes the economy extremely unstable. While the bank is 10x leveraging its depositors' money by investing it in real estate or lending out high interest loans with money that doesn't exist, the bank is perpetually putting us on the precipice of an economic collapse. If a bank only has, let's say, 10% of its deposits in reserve, they can only pay back 10% of its customers. This can only work if depositors don't withdraw more than 10% of their money at once from the bank, and if people pay back their loans. If too much money is withdrawn at once, or if there's too many loan defaults, the bank either goes bankrupt or they suspend withdrawals. In such a crisis, banks turn to other banks to provide liquidity. But if this is a system-wide problem, they turn towards the government with the FDIC willing to pay up to $250,000 per person's account. All they need to do to get back the depositor's money is just amp up the Fed's money printer or increase our national debt or just increase taxes so people can get back the money they already earned but the bank squandered. I remember learning in school that during the Great Depression, that only the first in line could withdraw their money from the bank, and the rest of the people were screwed out of their savings. My history teacher told us this was because of a currency deflation since there wasn't enough money in circulation to give people their money, which is total nonsense. Banks weren't able to pay back as depositors not because we didn't have enough money flying off the money printer, it's because of fractional reserve banking. The banks lost all of their clients' money because they blew it all on speculative investments that went bust after the stock market crash with money that wasn't really there. This is the privatized profits and socialized losses I was talking about. They get to lend out your money and leverage it by 10 times its original deposit and reap the benefits of loan interest while you accrue a 0.1% interest rate in your savings account and the banks get bailed out by the government when these risky fiscal practices turn sour, which they always do. And average people are the ones who pay the most, especially when the government gets involved. One of the biggest reasons for the 2008 financial crash was caused when the government encouraged banks to have lower standards when issuing loans when the National Partnership and Homeownership Program started in 1995, sowing the seeds for the 2008 financial crisis. They wanted to increase the home ownership rate for Americans, which sounds good on paper, but they did it in the wrong way. The Federal National Mortgage Association called Fannie Mae, along with private banks, were encouraged to drastically lower their lending standards. What? Bad credit? No savings? No job? That doesn't matter. Here's a half a million dollar mortgage. Us banks can just offload any risky loans to government-sponsored enterprises. The banks builders, contractors made tons of profit, while the homeownership rates went up. Win-win, right? WRONG! These risky loanies finally started defaulting on their loans and the economy started imploding. Fannie Mae was bailed out for $191 billion along with most other banks, which was paid for through taxation, inflation, and borrowing. Homeownership rates declined and never recovered, but banking profits recovered very quickly. I know some people argue that the 2008 bank bailouts were a good thing since the recession would have been worse, but even if that's true, which is very debatable, it was only good in the short term. Long term, it's gonna be a huge nightmare since it just keeps piling on problems for future generations. The bailouts massively increased government expansion. Federal spending is nearly double what it used to be in 2008, which has greatly increased the government's obligations, most of which it can't afford. The US is currently in $34 trillion of debt, which is bad enough on its own, but that's just the current debt. This figure doesn't include future obligations. Future obligations for things like defense, social security, Medicaid, roads, and everything else the government claims it will pay for in the future. Currently, the end of century debt is estimated to be $93.8 trillion. Unless the government makes some major changes, 
This mind-boggling amount of debt is inevitable. To fix this, it's estimated that the Fed would have to cut all spending by 30% or have a 39% tax increase on everything, just so our debt doesn't get worse. That still wouldn't pay off debts that have already been accumulated. We may see some tax increases and some budget cuts, but it would be political suicide for politicians to put any real oomph behind cutting spending, since that would cut into entitlement programs. And it would be pretty difficult to take away an extra 40% of people's paychecks without major pushback. Hell, a 40% increase to keep up with debt might be an understatement. By economist Jeffrey Myron's estimates, our debt will be $117.9 trillion. Assuming the interest rate stays the same, the interest payment alone will be $3.7 trillion, which is more than the entire 2015 federal budget. But I doubt much debt repayment will be done with tax increases or budget cuts since it's hard to do these things to any significant degree since it would be political suicide. It will probably be done with inflation, cause that's much more covert and easier to hide. But America and many other countries in a similar debt boat might not be around before they can get into that much debt. There's usually a major conflict before countries can accrue this much of a deficit. The world has never gotten out of this much debt peacefully. In the intro, I mentioned that Thomas Paine said that a central bank would create a nation of stock jobbers. The literal definition of a stock jobber is a person who sells worthless securities. So a stock jobber is a practically useless job that makes money through financial wizardry instead of doing something tangibly productive. Today, this translates to the bullshit jobs phenomenon, which is the theory that most of the economy is made up of fake jobs. Jobs that aren't doing anything practically useful for the world and exist purely to keep people working. There's a book by David Graeber about this, and there are also some really good videos that go into more detail. I'll link them in the description. But around 50% of people think that their jobs are totally useless, or at least aren't sure if they are useful. That's a pretty sad figure. 50% of people spend 40 hours a week at a place they hate and aren't even sure if the job they're doing is at all useful. During the COVID lockdowns, there was this differentiation between essential and non-essential workers. A significant chunk of the economy either got sent home or fired. But even with a significant chunk of people not working, food got to the table, the lights stayed on, Walmart had Funko Pops in stock. Not counting inflation, prices stayed about the same. Kind of weird when 23 million people lost their jobs and even the people who kept their jobs worked way less. There is a good chance that if you were considered a non-essential worker during this time, you had a bullshit job. I believe that having a currency that is being constantly inflated by the Federal Reserve is probably the biggest cause of why so many jobs are pointless and also the reason why people have to work so long. While inflation is putting more money in circulation, deflation is taking money out of circulation. Since there is less money, it becomes more valuable. Common arguments against deflation is that it leads to falling prices, which leads to lower consumer spending, so companies slow down production, which leads to layoffs and pay cuts. Which on paper is true, but the reason people would be getting laid off is because bullshit jobs would be less prevalent. Because a deflationary currency encourages businesses and individual people to be more efficient. It makes banks get tighter on credit lending and discourages the government from getting in more debt. Short term, a deflationary currency would look bad since there would definitely be a loss of jobs, especially bullshit jobs. But long term, the economy would be much more efficient and people would overall be able to retire earlier. Deflation would cut the fat off the economy. And about the claim that consumer spending would go down, consumer spending doesn't get lower because companies can't produce enough goods. It slows down because deflation encourages people to save, since money itself becomes an investment. If you think something is going to be more valuable in the future, like a stock or a Pokemon card, you're gonna wait to sell it. It's the same with a deflationary currency. It encourages people to save since their money will be worth more in the future. People having to wage slave at their 9 to 5 until their late 60s to get social security wouldn't be nearly as prevalent. 
if your money is inflationary, who cares if you spend it all on squishmallows and bionicles? Since if you just kept your money in a savings account, it will only go down in value, so you might as well spend it. I bet inflation is one of the, if not the biggest reason why we live in a consumerist culture. But if your savings account became an investment, which it would if the currency started to deflate, people may only have to work, I don't know, a decade or so, instead of the current 40 to 50 years of work to retire. Not saying we should do something crazy like take 50% of the money out of circulation all at once. Too much deflation can be a problem, but just having a consistent small amount of deflation every year would do wonders. <laughs> Like that's ever gonna happen. Inflation is too beneficial to banks and the government for a deflationary currency to be considered. The banks make tons of money from it, and the government can fund whatever it wants. Things like war. I think there was a strong argument that a significant amount of the wars in recent history were able to happen because of central banks. It's probably not a coincidence that the world wars happened soon after all the countries involved got central banks. Governments used to fund wars with their gold reserves. Money used to be inherently valuable since the currency contained precious metals like gold or silver. Since they didn't have access to the money printer, these countries had to be more efficient with their resources. They more often found diplomatic solutions to prevent war. And if war did break out, they had more economic incentives to end the war as soon as possible, since they couldn't just create gold out of thin air. But by the early 1900s, most Western governments' monetary limits were removed, since the central bank could just make more money if they needed it. So, governments had less economic decentives to start wars, since economic consequences were easier to dampen. Banking in general is a good war promoter. Many bankers who funded the world wars had no loyalty to any nation, and had incentives to keep the wars going, because the massive amounts of loans governments took out to fund these conflicts made them tons of money. If the Reichsbank, the central bank of the Weimar Republic, didn't ruin the economy by making a 160 mark loaf of bread cost 200 billion marks a year later, would Hitler have gotten into power? I don't know, but certainly it would have been less likely. Would Hitler have had the money to fund his rearmament program without a central bank? Who knows? Would the $6.4 trillion America spent on its forever wars in the Middle East or the $1 trillion spent on Vietnam have costed too much? Maybe. Something like a central bank revisionist history would require its own video. But what we do know is that the Fed can fund whatever it wants by ramping up the money printer. So funding wars is not nearly as much as a problem. To bomb Arabs in the Middle East, the only thing the government needed to do was to decrease Americans' buying power. It's a win-win for the state. The people in power didn't have to risk angering the population by directly increasing taxes to raise money. They silently tax people via inflation. If we had to immediately pay for our foreign intervention, it would be a lot harder to get people on board for a war if taxes had to be increased. So they used inflation and deficit borrowing, since it's a lot more subtle. The US spent $32 billion on World War I. Adjusted for inflation, that's around $776 billion. But only 22% of this cost came from taxation. 58% was raised through Fed-backed borrowing, much of which would be paid for through inflation just at a later time, and the rest of the 20% was just created out of thin air. Could America afford to enter World War I without a central bank? I doubt it. And at the time of World War I, the Fed had much less power than it has now. The financial holes it can currently dig are much deeper than ever before. Whether the government is spending money on war or on welfare, most of the money doesn't come from taxes, which is mostly paid for by the rich. It's paid for via inflation, which is a tax that especially hurts lower income earners. The way the economy currently runs can't last forever. Pretty much all new banking legislation revolves around trying to iron out problems caused by the Federal Reserve and banking malpractice. Since it's an inherently unstable system, it's always prone towards collapse. The system has lasted surprisingly long for how fundamentally flawed it is. But if people pay back their loans on time, and too many people don't withdraw money at once, and the central bank doesn't do anything too extreme, the ship we call the economy can stay afloat. 
I think this situation is much worse than what government statistics show, which are already pretty bleak. But the Consumer Price Index saying that prices have only gone up 18% between 2020 and 2023 is totally ludicrous. Anecdotally, I'd say my grocery bill has gone up at least 50%. And I'm sure many viewers have had similar experiences. With the M1 money supply stock going from $4 trillion in circulation to $18 trillion within a few years, it's hard to imagine an only 20% CPI increase. I mean, it's not really that hard to fudge the CPI's numbers. The $6 trillion COVID spending deficit has to come from somewhere. And it didn't come from taxes. It was paid for with inflation. Banks have become too big to fail because the government is doing its damnedest to patch all the holes in this slowly sinking ship. The ship will eventually sink. Nobody knows when, but it is inevitable. It's impossible to accurately predict financial crashes. The economy could last a few months to a few decades. The USSR, which was one of the most horribly managed economies ever, survived 70 years. But eventually, something will happen. Who knows what the catalyst could be? It could be hyperinflation, and the money becomes worthless, so we get a Weimar Republic situation, where people need a whole wheelbarrow of cash just to buy a loaf of bread. Or it could be a real estate crash, where banks take huge losses on the investments they did with other people's money, and everyone loses their savings accounts, similar to the 2008 financial crash. But this time, the government's not able to fix it. Or it could be something else entirely. Many critics of the current system blame our problems on having a paper currency. Paper money is fake in the literal and metaphorical sense. In the metaphorical sense, paper money is fake since on its own it's worthless and has no practical use. It is purely a social convention to make trade easier. But even in a literal sense, much of our money doesn't exist as paper dollars in any way, shape, or form, and is just a product of fractional reserve banking and other methods of money creation. This is why having paper money in general is really risky. Even if it is backed by gold, the money can still become worthless due to inflation and other money creating methods. The gold will retain its value, but the dollar will not. A prime example of the dangers of gold-backed paper money happened under President Franklin Roosevelt. He signed Executive Order 6102 and made it illegal for American citizens to own more than 5 ounces of gold and arbitrarily increased the price of an ounce of gold from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. If you were an entity who had a lot of gold, like the government, this was great for you. But if you were like most people and didn't own much gold, you lost nearly half of your gold to dollar exchange power. The currency was completely debased for the government's benefit. This executive order by Roosevelt stayed in place for about 40 years. It wasn't until 1974 that Americans were allowed to own more than 5 ounces of gold. This also happened when we got off the Bretton Woods gold standard in 1971, and the US defaulted on its promise to sell 1 ounce of gold for $35 to foreign governments who held US dollars. Within a decade, gold prices went up by a factor of 18, and today, gold prices are nearly 64 times as valuable as gold was before 1971, because unlike the dollar, gold actually keeps its value. So gold-backed paper money still mostly benefits banks and the government, and isn't necessarily an improvement to unbacked paper money when it comes to keeping the value of the dollar. I'm convinced that the only solution is to have the medium of exchange itself be made of precious metals. I mean, it's literally unconstitutional to have it any other way. But maybe it could come back in an unorthodox sense. Possibly in the form of cryptocurrency. I think crypto could either be a great blessing or a financial scourge. But that would have to be its own video. Even if the fundamental flaws of the economy are easy to see and the solutions obvious, we might already be in too deep of a hole. How would we reinstall a gold standard after decades without one? What would the exchange rate be without screwing people over? How would the government pay off its debt if our currency becomes stable or even deflationary? Because the government would default on its loans without inflation. How would we turn a cash and credit based society into a gold one? It would be a logistical nightmare. It would require nothing less than a financial revolution to undo this debt pyramid. Assuming it's not too late. The current economic system has held out surprisingly long, but eventually this shoddy economic ship we're sailing on is going to sink. 
the 2008 financial crisis and the 2020 COVID lockdowns were an economic storm we barely managed to tread. Who knows how many more storms we can take. But looking at the whole, I can't imagine it's very many. 